From its earliest days, Arlington House was home not only to the Custis and Lee families who occupied the mansion, but also to dozens of enslaved people who lived and labored on the estate. For nearly 60 years, Arlington functioned as a complex society made up of owners and enslaved people, whites and blacks. To some observers on the surface, Arlington appeared as a harmonious community in which the owners and enslaved people often lived and worked side by side. Yet, an invisible gulf separated the two, as enslaved people were the legal property of their owners. The enslaved possessed no rights and could be permanently separated from their families at a moment's notice. The contributions of the Arlington enslaved people have been a vital component of the Arlington House history from the very beginning. In 1802, the first slaves to inhabit Arlington arrived at the estate with their owner, George Washington Park Custis, the grandson of Martha Washington and the step-grandson of George Washington. Custis was adopted by the Washingtons and had grown up in Mount Vernon, as had many of his enslaved people. Upon Martha Washington's death, Custis inherited her slave people and purchased others who belonged to his mother, Eleanor Custis Stewart. In all, Custis owned nearly 200 enslaved people and many as 63 lived and worked at Arlington. Once at Arlington, the slaves began construction on log cabins for their homes. And then began work on the main house. Using the red clay soil from the property and shelves from the Potomac River, they made the bricks and stucco used in the walls and exterior of the house. The enslaved people also harvested timber from the Arlington Forest, which was used for the interior flooring and supports. Day to day, the enslaved people were responsible for keeping up the house and laboring on the plantation, working to harvest corn and wheat, which was sold at a market in the city of Washington. Some enslaved people had a very close relationship with the Lee and Custis members. Though these relationships were very much governed by the social hierarchy which existed between the enslaved and slaveholders. Mr. Custis relied heavily on his carriage driver, Daniel Dotson. And Mrs. Lee had a very personal relationship with the head housekeeper, Selena Gray. A reflection of their relationship, Mrs. Lee entrusted Selena with the keys to the plantation at the time of the Lee's evacuation from Arlington in May, 1861. There is evidence that some slaves at Arlington House were given the opportunity to learn to read and write so they could read the Bible. Around the 1840s, Mrs. Custis persuaded her husband to free several women and children. Some of these emancipated people lived on the Arlington estate, including Maria Carter Syfax, who lived with her husband Charles on a 17-acre plot given to her by the Custis family around the time of her emancipation, around 1826. In his will, George Washington Park Custis stipulated that all the Arlington enslaved people should be freed upon his death if the estate was found to be in good financial standing or within five years otherwise. When Custis died in 1857, Robert E. Lee, the executor of the estate, 
was determined that the slave labor was necessary to improve Arlington's financial status. The Arlington enslaved people found Lee to be a more stringent taskmaster than his predecessor. Eleven enslaved people were hired out while others were sent to Pamoke River estates. In accordance with the Custis instructions, Lee officially freed the enslaved people on December 29, 1862.